Well, greetings and welcome to part two of our video extravaganza on tube reverb. First, we'll start off with some uh, greater detail on how transducers work, and then we'll move on to a chart of characteristics which will define the shape, spring count, impedance, etc. of all reverb tanks. I also wanted to take a moment to thank those of you who have made Patreon pledges to help support our channel and also PayPal contributions. Thanks so much. You're keeping us on the air. Also, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that we're closing in on a great milestone here of 50,000 subscribers. I never thought I'd see the day when I first started out with my pitiful little video camera and, as I recall, a P10 Wurlitzer jukebox. But here we are, and it's all to do with you all, and I really want to express my thanks. I only wish that Rusty could be uh, with us here to celebrate, uh, but I'm sure wherever Rusty is at the moment, he knows. I've been looking for Jack everywhere, and the uh, last I saw him, he was in the bedroom, uh, laying on the bed, but I'm not sure where. With such a large viewing audience, we're really blessed that among those out there in YouTube land are some real experts on different topics. And one of them uh, came forth and drew my attention to three improvements on our understanding of transducers. First off, as I recall in part one, I told you that there was a spring that held the little rod back here to the end of the tubular uh, passage. Uh, and that's not true. It's actually a wire. Now that makes a lot more sense to me because if it were a spring, I would think that these str uh, stronger springs out here would be able to pull the rod out of the range of the electromagnets. Uh, therefore, a, a uh, piece of steel wire here keeps it always centered uh, between the magnetic poles. Secondly, the rod itself is magnetized. Uh, you can prove this to yourself very quickly. If you have a tank, touch it with a little piece of steel wire and the wire will stick to it. So it is a magnet. It is not a passive victim of a magnetic field. It is in itself a magnet. And third, uh, I believe a lot of us were under the misconception, myself included, that the laminations here would move that rod vertically so it would go up and down or left and right. Sort of like when you take the end of a piece of rope and two people are holding the rope and you flip it like that and it makes a uh, nice sine wave. It's not like that at all. Instead, think of the little uh, metal rods that we know now are actually magnets as the armature of a motor. And when the oscillating magnetic field is applied to the laminations, the rods rotate first one direction and then the other in response and apply a rotational or torsional force to the spring. So the spring is being wound up and unwound. Uh, that's a little harder to visualize than a sine wave, but the uh, energy will pass through the spring in exactly the same way. And one final detail that I wanted to add is that the springs in a reverb tank are of different length. Uh, you can see here these are two springs from an Accutronics tank. They are completely different length but recall that they're both stretched to the same overall length when they're in the tank itself. So this spring will be under greater tension than this spring, and just like guitar strings, when you tune one at a higher tension than another, you get a completely different response from the string, so it is with the springs, and we will get a different rate of passage of our reverb signal through the uh, more stretched spring than the less stretched spring, which gives us a greater variety in our reverb overtones. Now let's look at the code which is utilized to describe each different type of reverb tank. It's right here on this mod label 4AB3C1B. Rather complex, but every single letter and number 
will define a particular characteristic of this tank. Let's take a look at a chart that will help us to uh, decode uh, this description. I have downloaded uh, and printed uh, the chart that's readily available on the internet. Just do a quick search for uh, reverb tank characteristics uh, or specifications, something like that. You will find this chart. Let's take a look at it now in detail. Okay, the code on our mod tank started out with four. Okay, let's look here at the first characteristic, and that is tank type, which has to do with length and the number of springs. Number one is a short tank with two springs. Number four is a long tank with two springs. Number eight, a short tank with three springs. Number nine, a long tank with three springs. If you recall, our mod tank began with a four, so it is a long tank, 16 and 3 quarters inch long, with two transmission springs. Next, we move to a letter designation. This will be the second symbol in the ID code of the tank. And it tells the input impedance. This column is if you have a two spring tank. This column here is if you have a three spring tank. Now notice a very familiar impedance, and that is eight ohms. Uh, recall that we think of the tank in most of our tube uh, type tran uh, transformer driven reverbs as being equal to a speaker. Well, there's your classic speaker impedance. Uh, in other words, if we have a type A tank, which we do here, the mod tank that we just looked at was type A, it's a 4A, that means the input impedance is indeed 8 ohms. You could substitute an 8 ohm speaker for this tank and it would work just fine. Now a very helpful little addition to this chart is the DC resistance, which is uh, equivalent to the impedance in each of these coils. Now most of us cannot look at a coil and say, oh gosh, there's an 8 ohm one, I uh, wish I could, but I can measure the DC resistance of the coil. And what this is saying is, if you have an unknown tank and you'd like to know what the input uh, impedance is, measure the DC resistance of the coil and if it is say 30 ohms then it is either a 200 ohm impedance uh, transducer or if it's a 3 spring it's a 240 ohm impedance transducer. Now you're probably wondering why we have all these other input impedances. Well, not all reverb tanks are driven by uh, an output transformer like the one that we are seeing in our 6G15 uh, that is our sample for this video. Some are driven directly by tubes with no output transformer and others are driven by uh, solid state devices um, and they, uh, those, both the tube and the solid state device will have completely different uh, input impedance requirements to function properly with the tank. So these tanks are made for purposes other than a transformer driven tube reverb. Everything I said about the last uh, portion of the chart is true about this one except this is output impedance. And as you can see, uh, it's much higher because we're not dealing with the secondary of an output transformer. We're actually putting out to a tube grid. Okay, so the output impedance will be different. You still have your DC resistance measurements here to help you identify an unknown tank. Now the fourth character in our uh, tank ID code is decay time. It will be either one, two, or three. Number one denotes a very short decay time. The echo effect that we have in a reverb will, will not be very deep. It will only last for about 1.2 to 2 seconds. Number two would be a medium decay time or dwell of 1.75 to 3 seconds. Uh, number three, which is what our mod tank that we have here today uh, has on it, uh, 
denotes a long decay time. Now look at this. This is significant. 2.75 to 4 seconds. So if you are using a tank uh, with the long decay time and hit uh, one note, that note has overtones that will persist for up to four seconds. So this would be as lush and long a dwell as you could ever hope for. Now the fifth character of our code will tell if the jacks that, with which we connect to the tank are grounded or insulated. Zero means grounded, one means insulated. If that uh, letter is A, then we know that both of the jacks are grounded to the tank itself. B, we know that the input's grounded, output is not. C, input is insulated, uh, output is grounded. And in D, both of the jacks are insulated. Now you have to be very careful. You can't substitute uh, one tank for another with this regard or else you might end up with a ground loop. Let's take a look at a type C tank. That means the output is grounded and the input is not. It's kind of hard to tell, uh, really, by looking, but let's see if we can't do it. Uh, this is a little printed circuit board that's on the inside of the tank connected to the jack. If you look, there's a little insulation right here in the printed circuit trace and a little bit of insulation right here. That means that in this particular uh, jack, uh, which is the input jack, uh, the uh, shield up here is not connected to ground because the insulation still is in place. Okay, now let's look at the output jack and you can see that the printed circuit board has been altered and that bit of insulation between the shield and ground has been jumpered with solder. Therefore this output jack uh, the, has a grounded shield. The shield is connected to the tank itself. Okay, the sixth character in our ID code for the tank tells whether or not there is a locking device. Now what the heck does that mean? Well, as you recall, the springs are located on a platform that is spring-loaded within the tank. Now when you're carrying the amplifier or reverb tank around, that little platform's thrashing all around and banging into things, which can't help uh, preserve the wires to the transducers or the quality or condition of the springs. So some tanks come with a locking mechanism built in, which will go in and grab a hold of that uh, floating platform and hold it steady. Most tanks don't. I've only seen one tank in my life that had the lock on it, and it was, I think, a 79 RT Gibson uh, amplifier. But uh, you're rarely going to see that. So almost every uh, tank you look at is going to have a number one in the sixth position. And the final characteristic is a very important one and often overlooked. The best way to suspend a reverb tank, and we're going to see why in just a second, I'll show you, is to have it mounted vertically. And it can be either way with the connectors pointing up, or the jacks, or the connectors pointing down. So C, it's mounted vertically on the wall of the cabinet, connectors up. D, vertically on the wall of the cabinet, connectors down. The second best is to have it on end, believe it or not. It would take a tall cabinet. Once again, uh, the GA79RT that I uh, had had a vertically mounted uh, tank like this. And in this case, uh, they, they get really finicky. E means that the input jack is up. F means that the output jack is up. And finally, the very worst of all options, and the one you see most often, which is kind of sad, particularly in Fender amplifiers, is they will uh, put the tank flat on the bottom of the cabinet and generally cover it with like a vinyl bag of some sort. But uh, for reasons we'll see in just a few uh, minutes, this is by far the worst way you can possibly mount a tank. Uh, and 
uh, you can designate this terrible way of mounting the tank either A, which is open side up, which would be like on the roof of the cabinet, or B, open side down. B is uh, the way almost all fender tanks are mounted. Sad but true. Now some of you may have already figured out why the horizontal on the floor positioning of the tank is the least desirable. Uh, let's look at this. Remember the laminations? Or horizontal. Uh, look at the uh, magnetic uh, rod here and imagine that heavy springs are connected to it in this axis. Don't you see how it's going to be sagging down toward the laminations and may even touch it? And I'm going to bet you that if it does touch it, uh, it will make quite a bit of noise in the reverb tank. And as you can see, it's going to be this way whether you have the tank open side down or open side up. Now in the best position uh, the laminations are either pointing up or down depending on whether your jacks are pointed up or down but either way you see that the weight of the spring in this axis is not causing the rod, the magnetic rod, to deviate toward the laminations but is going to keep that rod centered between them. And the weight of the springs will be borne equally at both ends of the tank. And the second best mounting uh, position is a little hard to demonstrate, but imagine that the tank is vertically aligned, uh, standing up uh, from the bottom to the top of the cabinet, and our springs are attached to the magnetic rods in this format. You can see a gravity will not cause them to drift toward the laminations but will uh, allow them to remain properly centered. The problem with this arrangement and why it's second best is that the weight of the springs are not equally distributed. The weight for the upper transducer is minimal while the weight for the lower transducer will be maximum and uh, this uh, uneven burden will no doubt affect the propagation of the waves through the spring. And here we have Jack helping with the office duties with the shredding of valuable documents. There he goes, he's helping. He shredded himself if you let him. Now that we've covered all aspects of the reverb tank Let's move on to the third and final portion of our reverb unit circuit. As you may recall, our circuit ends up with a 12 AX7 tube, or a 7025 if you prefer. Uh, the uh, one triode is going to receive uh, the signal uh, from the reverb tank uh, to its grid, and then output the uh, slightly amplified signal from its plate through this coupling capacitor. The lower triode is going to receive the uh, dry signal that has not been altered in any way by the reverb tank. That signal will come to uh, its grid, but if you notice, the output is not from the plate, it is from the cathode, and it travels through a coupling capacitor here where it meets up with the wet uh, reverb signal. Now I'm going to give you a few seconds to try to come up with the reason why this signal is output from the plate, this signal is output from the cathode. Pause the video if you need a little time to think. Okay, now I'm going to tell you my theory, uh, see if it agrees with yours or yours may be better. If so, let us know in the comments section. Recall that every time we drive the grid and get a signal output by the plate, the phase of the signal is reversed. So uh, our signal comes in here, it is reversed. Here it's put back to the original phase. Here it's reversed. Here it's put back to the original phase. So the wet signal that comes here to the mixer is going to be in phase with the input signal. The dry signal, however, comes down here and drives the grid 
this uh, plate signal, if we used it and brought it over here and, and took it to the mixer, would be out of phase and these would essentially neutralize each other. So instead we take the in phase signal from the cathode and bring it to the mixer. So we have two in phase uh, signals arriving at the mixer. One is wet, one is dry. The only other aspects of the circuit that need to be discussed uh, would be the uh, tone control here and it operates as all passive tone controls do in that it allows, depending on its setting, a more or less of the high frequencies to escape to ground through this capacitor. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, reverb generally works best on higher frequencies and gets real muddy on low frequencies. So I don't think that this tone control uh, should ever be turned uh, into a position which allows a lot of high frequency to go to ground. And finally we have the mixer control pot. Uh, I think it should be very obvious how this works. We have the wet signal coming in here and the dry signal coming in here and depending on the position of the wiper will either favor the wet signal, the reverb signal, or favor the dry signal. Or we can put it right in the middle and you'd get a 50-50 mix. That then will be output to the uh, grid uh, of the first preamp tube of our amplifier. Alright, we've completely reviewed the entire circuit now with great uh, emphasis on the different types of reverb tanks and the overall idea of how we end up then with our mixer control and our output signal to our amp. Now uh, let's take the reverb unit out into the workshop and start to do some practical uh, experiments with it. Let's hook up a speaker uh, right here and see if the, the little Fender Champ uh, portion of our circuit actually does function as an independent amplifier. Let's hook an oscilloscope up to the wet and dry signals and see if they really look as different as they sound. And let's come up with a couple other experiments here and there to further our understanding of this circuit. Okay, we're out in the workshop. I pulled the back off the 6G15 clone. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick look here. We're going to go into detail on how it was built to help those of you who want to build your own. One thing I'll draw your attention to here that I was kind of proud of is I put a grounded partition between the power supply and the uh, reverb amplifier. Now I've located where the output from the 6 uh, V6 or 6K6 is supposed to go to the reverb tank and it's right here and I've also connected uh, another lead to ground and I have connected that to a speaker cable and it is going over here to my venerable workshop speaker. My intention is to plug a guitar into the input jack and then using the dwell as a volume control uh, we're going to see uh, whether or not our reverb driver amplifier here can actually function as a standalone amplifier as we're told it can. Okay, we've got the guitar plugged into the input. We've got our speaker connected to the output of the 6V6 in this case. I've uh, got the dwell up to about 8 out of 10, which is fairly high volume. Let's see if we can hear anything. Yes, uh, it's a little tinny. It sounds like it's a little overdriven by the guitar. I tend to think that uh, that tells us that our little uh, three element amp here is better geared to driving the reverb tank than it is a speaker, but with a few minor modifications that could be changed. Either way, we have proven the uh, old adage that uh, the reverb tank and speaker are essentially interchangeable. Well, I think that ought to about do it uh, for this part two video. In part three, uh, this is what I propose. Uh, let's hook up an oscilloscope and take a look at the wet and dry signal and see if there's a visual difference between them. Uh, let's uh, try each of the controls, the dwell, mixer, and tone, and see how they affect the output from the speaker, uh, the sound, uh, the reverb effect, and such. 
And let's take a real close-up look at uh, the wiring, grounding, mechanical effects, and all that uh, I incorporated into my own uh, build. Uh, they might give you some advice or help uh, for yours. Okay, so now let's take off and go back to that car show that we saw a few videos ago and take a look at a whole bunch of hot rods. I'll see you again in part three. This is an interesting car. It's one I'm, I actually thought about buying. The guy's trying to sell it. Kind of a strange cabriolet top. And it's an early Chevy. I'm not exactly sure what, 28 or something like that, 29. Uh, you got the traditional 350 engine in it. And the thing that's really weird is look up here at the front. It's got this, it looks like louvers, but they're not a cover here across the front. Uh, remember, you know how Model A's are cut in here and they have a splash panel underneath the radiator? Well, Chevy had a different idea. And I don't know, some like it, some don't. To be honest with you, I, I didn't care for it that much. I thought I might remove it if I bought the car. But overall, pretty snazzy. Not as perfect as a lot of the cars here, but it does have potential. Okay, I'll get a grip on your undies because uh, you're liable to drop them when you see this joke. Talk about like black glass. Absolutely gorgeous paint job. Recrum front. Unassuming interior, pretty pretty plain, but nice. Look at the bed. I love the dark they stand with. Everybody goes with the light. But I kind of prefer the dark myself. And he's got the big tires and wheels, which are the sort of um, let's just say the popular way to do things nowadays. I don't really care for it. I like the 15 to 17 inch uh, five spokes and not the 21, 22 inch, the big ones. It seems like an anachronism to me to put these real modern wheels on an old car. To me, there were plenty of really neat looking wheels from this period that you could have put on instead, but that's the way it goes. Got a gang of vultures on the wire back here watching us. Well, that's that. About the straightest, nicest um, early 60s uh, Chevy truck you'll ever see. Now take a look at this gem. Uh, 63 or 64 Pontiac convertible. Uh, nothing pretentious about it. Uh, he needs those Pontiac racing wheels. Of course, they're about $9,000 a piece, but easy for me to say. I'm not paying for them. But that's one of those cars you put on the top and go cruising, and I don't think you're, gonna, you're ever going to see another one. Pretty slick. I haven't seen this car before. There's another gem with uh, obviously underpowered. Uh, I doubt that you'd have much competition at the stoplight, unless there's somebody in a Lamborghini with a chip on their shoulder. Um, very interesting, also for sale or trade. So be sure to make offers and I'll forward them to him. Something you don't see a lot of, chrome, uh, just chrome reverse steel wheels. Kind of old school. Very, very nice interior. I like that wood dash. It's beautiful. I don't think I've ever seen one like that. Very nicely done. How about this? From the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, this guy drives this thing everywhere. He's driven it to Canada. He's driven it probably to Alaska, for all I know. Um, it's got some goofy rack here in the back. Uh, look at the top. Looks like something you put up over a picnic table. You know, it's not to my taste, but I've got to admire the fact that guy built it himself and uh, didn't use a lot of high dollar parts. He does have three twos, which is a nice touch that you don't see that much of. And he does drive it. And a lot of these cars, I notice there's trailers uh, parked outside of the car show. These guys uh, trailer them around, they don't drive them. But this thing, for whatever flaws and weirdness it may have, gets driven all the time. And there's a lot to be said for that. Look at this. Speaking of a Model A pickup, in incredible condition. 
So what did you get rid of? Original engine, everything. Beautiful shape. Makes me feel guilty. But mine was never, it never had the potential to be this nice. Um, a little unsynchronized first gear. That's spectacular. Rare as hints to Here uh, we're taking a look at another tea bucket. Uh, seeing quite a few of them. I understand there's a resurgence of interest in them. Which I think they'll find out after they've had one why they died out in the first place. Anyway, everything looks good, doesn't it? How about that bed? This I put up at the top of my what were they thinking list to put that bed on this car. It just doesn't make any sense to me, but you know, that's what makes the world go round. That's why they put knobs on TV sets so you can change the channel. Anyway, uh, Pretty well done. Okay, we've got one here that's a work in progress. Uh, the guy was telling me he just got it running just the other day and decided to bring it. The engine's a 66 Impala 327 with the three twos. And you can tell it's got those camel hump heads that everybody gets all excited about. Uh, he's breaking in the engine. He wants to get a thousand miles on it. Then he's gonna disassemble the car, paint it, upholster it, and uh, finish it. Uh, look at that. Somebody uh, fabricated a nice gas tank for him. You see all the spun aluminum ones, which are fine, but this is kind of neat. Real homemade looking. Get that uh, transverse leaf spring rear axle. Pretty snazzy. And I have a feeling when it's done next year, uh, we'll get a look at it. Uh, and he has a grill shell on and all. It's going to look even better. Well, in the something for everyone category, we've got the 57 Chevy two-door hardtop in black with fender skirts. And real abstract art top. Original looking dash. Got that saddle blanket seat covers. And uh, some imaginative, oh, that's 57 Chevy wheel, uh, hubcaps, I think. And engine-wise, pretty slick. He's using some vintage parts on the engine, and it says it's a 350, 300 horse. I have no reason to doubt that. Pretty unusual. Then here's that orange beast that we saw coming in, making all the noise. I told you I'd get a close look. It's like a small block Chevy with a, about a 671 blower, two four barrels, headers. Good lord. Nice interior too, look at that. Pretty slick. Same steering wheel I have in uh, one of my trucks that you haven't seen yet. Oh, some nice narrow rear tires. No matter how wide they are, they're probably not quite wide enough. Look at this thing. What a monster. Well, I think that takes the cake.